When I was a young man, I went to a Bible study and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I remember that was the first time that I heard the full gospel preached. I don't have to be sick. I don't have to be poor. I don't have to be defeated by the devil, but I can live in the blessing of God. At Karis Christian Center, I would say that our number one goal is to get people to know Jesus. I believe that's the ultimate goal of the gospel. Whenever people leave a service, I'd rather have them leaving saying, man, Jesus is so great. I'm so in love with Jesus. I'm so in love with the Word. See everybody, the purpose that God has created them for, fulfilled. Every born-again believer ought to be a member of a church. I was raised in a traditional church, but I didn't understand the goodness of God. I didn't understand the full gospel, that God was for me, that God God wanted to bless me, that God wanted to heal me, that God wanted to help me in every area of life. We preach the full gospel where people can not only come to know Jesus, experience the grace of God, but they can begin to see the power of God manifest in their life. The teachings that we have received here that God wants me well. No, I don't have to be sick. No, I don't have to have anxiety. I don't have to have panic attacks. And we were just overwhelmed and grateful that God had brought us here. I believe that the church that Jesus is building is changing the world. As we're connected to a local body and submitted to Jesus Christ and submitted to godly leadership, that our influence actually becomes greater in the earth. There's so many ways that you can get connected with Karis Christian Center. You can get connected just by attending, you know, through receiving the Word of God. They can get connected online through receiving the message, enjoying the praise and worship, but they can also get connected in the youth, in the children's ministry, in our men's ministry, Karis Men, in our Flourish women's ministry. These ministries are changing people's lives. It's been a blessing to really thousands of people around the world as we've shared the gospel, and I want other people to find the same joy that I've found in receiving the goodness of God, but also sharing the goodness of God with others. Download the Caris Christian Center mobile app today. Day or night, you can send us your prayer requests where our team of anointed prayer ministers can pray over you. We also make it safe and secure for you to give or partner with this ministry so that you can give with peace of mind. You also have access to all the hundreds of hours of teaching right at your fingertips. So download the Caris Christian Center mobile app wherever you get your favorite apps today.
Good morning, church. Why don't you guys just stand up on your feet? Who knows, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Come on, let's clap. When the doubt in my way tries to steal what you say, saying I have no reason to pray.
so glad to be the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And we stand today completely free. And if you're not free, I hope you get free by the time we get done singing today. Come on. There's freedom in this place. There's joy to be found. together, as we lift our voices, our heart, and our lives as one, things happen. You're one body today, come on church. Oh, we need every part.
God. Your will be done in this place. God, we thank you that we have a picture of your will. In the life and death of Jesus Christ. Your will would be for not a person in this place to leave sick, tired, depressed, overwhelmed, God. If you have a healing for every single thing. Right now, I just declare it would break out in this place. Would you agree with me, church? Break out in this place. Your will be done.
Praise the Lord. Go ahead and give him a shout. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you to worship you and praise you and glorify you for all that you have already done for us, that we are overcomers because of the battle that Jesus already fought and won. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took the authority and gave it back to us so that we don't have to walk and run in fear, but that we can stand in boldness and declare the goodness of the Lord and his word. Lord, again, we just praise you and we lift you up. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Well, go ahead and give them another clap and a shout of hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, God is so good. It's just great to see everyone here today. Before you're seated, please turn to two or three people. Remind them how much they're loved, and then you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Again, it's just great to see everybody. And also, can we give a warm welcome for all of our first-time guests here today? Let's welcome them. Welcome everyone watching online right now. So if this is your first time as our guest, we want to invite you to help yourselves to one of those Connect cards that you'll find in the pocket in the chair in front of you. If you don't mind taking just a little bit of time to fill out that information, stop by the Connect Center on your way out in the foyer, and we do have a gift we want to send home with you, other helpful information about what's going on. You can make sure you pick up a bulletin. Hen, did you want to run up? You look like you're itching to preach. Are you all excited that we have a pastor who's excited to preach? Woo! And so um, anyway, you can also go on the website. A lot of exciting things are happening. We do have a midweek service here Wednesday that meets at 7 p.m. Hope to see you here in person. If not, you can live stream that. And then Thursday, we have our women's ministry flourish. The food and fun begins at 1130. The ministry time is at noon. You can also live stream that. Kim Trapp will be speaking. It's going to be an awesome time. So I'm excited. I think it's good to share some good news because, gosh, they're just... Always seems to be so much other news, yeah, but I believe hey, there's them. more good news. Kim, Kim works for Christian mm -hmm. Friends yep. of Israeli Communities, so we've supported them for years. And Kim and her husband, Greg, helped us start this church yeah. uh, 23 years ago, and they're still here. So they're amazing people, so uh, it'll be good. Yeah, so praise the Lord. So in between services, we actually had a special child dedication service. So three little cute babies were dedicated to the Lord. It was just a precious time with them, their parents and the grandparents and other special uh, friends. It just really touched my heart to see how parents in this church just take that so serious and are speaking the word of God over Amen. over them. And then what was really fun in before hey. first service, let me finish and then you get a turn. Okay. Well, we have, a, we have a brand new thing, and it's Children's called prayer. Prayers for Your Children. Yeah. And so I, I prayed at the Rejoice over these children, and Pastor Kevin Moore is here today, and he said, you need to take that and make that into a prayer. So it's a confession card. It's a prayer. You can pray it over your children, and it's out there, and you can get it free. You can send it to your, you can pray it over your children. Amen. Grandparents, send it to your children. They can pray it for their children. Prayed over your grandchildren. Prayed over the children in this church. Amen. And some really amazing things, some really good things are happening yeah. in children and youth. That's for good. Sure. We can see the fruit of that, not only with the parents that we got to spend some time in between services with, but before first service start, I was talking to some people, and I was talking to a young mom who has a son. I believe he's seven years old, and she was uh, saying how he has a friend who said, Harry Krishna is a god, and we must worship him. Oh, and yeah. her little boy spoke up and said, there is only one god. And Amen. he is God, and that's who we worship. And so a lot Amen. of the exciting things happening, you know, for a, a seven-year-old, the Bible says it's really important that we get the Word of God in our children's hearts. Amen. And I love it that even, I don't believe even his, the parents were around, but he spoke up and said, that is not a God. 
Amen. So even at an early age, they know who the one true God is. You know, awesome? when we lived in Kit Carson, we, li- we started out living in this duplex, and it was in low-income housing when we started pastoring. And um, Aaron went around to all the neighbors, and we didn't know these neighbors we had, but they were backslidden Baptists. And they lived in a little single wide trailer down the street. And Aaron went down and told him, if you don't believe on Jesus, you're going to hell. You got to believe on Jesus. <laughs> Get saved. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so, uh, hallelujah. He started preaching when he was about two or three. So, glory to God. He's still at it. Amen. God is so good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Open your Bible today. We're going to be sharing from the book of Esther. And so, you can just open it somewhere there in Esther. Uh, We'll get over there in a minute, but we're going to be talking about Esther. She was a tremendous woman of faith, and you know, I don't believe it's by chance that I happen to be teaching on Esther, but I had prepared this message earlier this week, and then just yesterday uh, afternoon, I was sent things by two different people, one who is uh, a conservative um, evangelical believer, stands for conservative political things here in the community. He, he is a born-again Jew, and then one uh, by Dr. Henderson about his family. And they, his family, actually, they were in bomb shelters and waiting. And so uh, the challenge that's being done there, but I, I replied to both of them, hey, I am preaching on Esther today, and I believe just like in times of old that God is going to protect his people, that God is going to protect the people of Israel. If you study history, you will find that there were seven Gentile empires prior to Christ's coming who stood against Israel. Every one of them lost their preeminence. Every one of them lost their power. They are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, if you study Bible prophecy, you will find that there is one that will oppress Israel in the future, and that is revised Rome. And just like every nation that has ever stood against Israel in the the former times, and even in current times, they have lost their preeminence, they have lost their power. Not only in former times, but in current times. In fact, I was saying something a number of years ago in Bible school, and one of the students came and said they brought up uh, a former uh, leader in South America who was violently opposing Israel uh, two years prior to that. I didn't know this, but they said, you know where he is right now? I said, no. They said, he is dead. Any nation that has ever stood against Israel in the history of the world has lost their preeminence, has lost their power. Now today we're going to be sharing from Esther. Esther lived in what we understand to be the media Persian Empire. It was the largest empire in the history of the world. The media Persian Empire ruled over 127 different nations from Western Europe to all through the Middle East to the eastern side of India from Northern Africa, you know, all that area. 127 different kingdoms. Now, in Daniel's time, Daniel's a tremendous book on Bible prophecy, but Daniel lived during the Babylonian Empire. He was actually in the Median Empire and the Persian Empire. So Daniel reigned under four different world leaders, right? And in three different world kingdoms. But when he was in the Babylonian Empire, the king of Babylon, world empire, largest empire in the world at that time, you know, greatest empire in the world, had a dream, and he forgot that dream. He could not remember the dream, and none of his wise men could tell him, so he was going to put them to death. But Daniel had three Hebrew friends. He said, pray with me, and he went to the king. He said, hey, give us a little bit of time, 
And I will tell you what the dream is. And I will tell you the interpretation. And God gave Daniel, showed him the dream, and showed him that interpretation. The dream is recorded in Daniel uh, chapter 2, I believe. But the first part of Daniel. And the dream was, there was an image and it had a head of gold. It had a breast and arms of silver. It had a belly and thighs of brass. It had legs of iron and then feet of iron and clay. The image stood until a stone cut without hands hit the image, not in the head, but in the feet. And when it hit the image in the feet, the image fell to the ground and the stone became a mountain that filled the whole earth. Of course, we know that Jesus is the headstone of the corner. Jesus is the stone cut without hands. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Not only did Daniel uh, have that vision that the king had, then gave the interpretation to the king, he told the king, you are this head of gold. In Daniel 7, Daniel had an, a, a dream about four beasts. The first one was, was a lion. The second one was a bear. And the bear had in its mouth three ribs. And it said, arise and devour much flesh. The, fourth, the third one was a leopard. The leopard had four wings. And then the, or the third one, the fourth one uh, was a great and terrible beast that spoke great swelling things, even against the Most High God. Now, in 2022, they put up an image at the United Nations headquarters in New York. So if you can bring that picture up of that image, that is the image of the beast of Daniel chapter 7. And what they are doing at the United Nations is mocking God. Now that image, because there was a lot of uh, different people came against it, they, uh, they took that image down. March 25th, 2024, the United Nations voted to command Israel to have a ceasefire. They voted for it. The U.S. could have vetoed it and stopped it completely. However, the U.S. did not veto that. They just let it go. Recently, Benjamin Netanyahu, the leader of Israel, was asked about what he thought about Joe Biden, President Joe Biden of the United States of America, and his uh, dealings with the people of Israel. I liked his answer. Benjamin Netanyahu said 86% of the people of the United States of America support Israel. So the United States of America supports Israel. I want you to say, to understand that government is to be of the people, by the people, and for the people. But the current administration does not stand for the values of the American people as a whole. So when we look into Esther, Esther lived in a time not unlike the times in which we live. Esther lived in a time where a wicked governor was trying to destroy the Jewish people, to annihilate them. I want you to realize that many Islamic countries and most Islamic world maps do not have the nation of Israel on them because they want to wipe Israel off of the face of the map. Islam controls over 630 times the territory of the nation of Israel. And yet in 1948, Israel became a nation against all odds. Israel has remained a nation 
against all odds. Egypt tried to destroy them a number of years ago, and Israel defeated Egypt in six days. I believe that God will defend Israel. I believe that God will defend his people. And if anybody in government leadership in the United States of America has a brain, we in the United States of America need to stand with Israel or we will lose our preeminence and we will lose our power just like history has showed us. With that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Esther, a woman of faith. I want to start in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Actually, we'll start in verse 13. Really, the heart of Esther is she lived for kingdom purpose. It says in Exodus, or Esther chapter 4, in verse 13 and 14, Then Mordecai, Mordecai was Esther's uncle. Esther's parents had died. Esther was an orphan who became queen because she lived by faith. And she was the queen of the largest Gentile empire in the world. It says, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Don't think with yourself that you will escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you altogether hold your peace at this time, then there will be an enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe that more than any other time or as much as any other time, we as the people of God are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. We are not called to stand on the side and say nothing. We are not called to turn a blind eye, but we are called to stand up. We are called to speak forth the truth. We are called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But if the salt has lost its savor, if we quit living by faith, we are good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden over by the feet of men. Esther was one of these people. She lived with a purpose from God. She lived by faith. She boldly declared her faith. She boldly stood for her faith in in the the face of death even to her and her people. Now, what happened if we go back to Esther chapter 1? The king was celebrating his kingdom. Again, 127 nations. The largest Gentile empire in the history of of the world. He was ruling over it. He had not just a little celebration, he had a six-month party. It was going for 180 days. At the end of this celebration, he wanted to bring his wife Vashti in, and he wanted to show her off to the kingdom. However, she refused to Come. She didn't want to be showed off. So the leaders that were in power with the Hashras, the king, said, We cannot have this type of rebellion in the kingdom. If your wife is this kind of a rebel, we are going to have rebel in every house in this kingdom. And so we got to stop the rebellion. You need to remove her from being queen. So he removed her. Then they said, what we're going to do, we're going to have a beauty contest. We're going to look throughout the 127 nations, and we're going to find the most beautiful young virgin, and we're going to bring her in, 
And whoever the king delights will be the new queen. Again, Esther's parents, they'd been killed. Esther was alive. She was serving, and her uncle Mordecai had taken her under his care. So when Mordecai heard about this, Mordecai uh, told Esther, whenever you go into this system, do not tell anyone who you are. Don't tell them that you're a Jew. Don't tell them from your Israel. Don't say anything about it. It says in Esther chapter 2, verse 8, it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard. And many maidens were gathered together to Shushan the palace, the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought unto the king's house to the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the woman. The maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her the things for her purification with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were sufficient to be given to her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Verse 10 says, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai charged her that she would not show it. Now the first key to faith that I really see in Esther was Esther lived with humility. Humility is a key to, our, to faith. In fact, the book of James is a great book on faith. The first chapter talks about the wisdom of faith. The second chapter talks about the acts of faith. The third chapter talks about the words of faith. The fourth chapter actually talks about the humility of faith. And finally, the fifth chapter talks about the patience of faith. In chapter 4, verse 6 and verse 7, James says this, He gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Somebody recently asked me the question, and I just taught on the subject of surrender. They said, Pastor, how do I surrender to God? Number one, you submit yourself to the lordship and dominion of Jesus Christ. Receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Number two, you submit yourself to the word of God. When the word of God says something, you let the word of God direct you, not just public opinion or someone else's opinion. Let the word of God be your guide. Then thirdly, every decision that I make, I want Jesus absolutely to be Lord of that decision. Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? A financial decision? a family decision, what, a business decision, whatever decision I make, I want Jesus to absolutely have his way in my life. I want Jesus to have his way in my finances. I want Jesus to have his way, right, in my family. I want Jesus to have his way in this church. I want Jesus to be glorified. I submit myself fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I submit myself to the word. I submit myself to the lordship of Jesus. Whatever you want. I really try to obey God in the area of finances, not only personally, but also in the area of this church. I do my very best to obey God. Amen? And I submit myself to the dominion and the authority of the Holy Spirit. I do not want to go against the Holy Spirit in any way, shape, or form in my life, period. See, some people are trying to res resist the devil, but they're not having a lot of victory. And the real reason is they really haven't submitted themselves 
totally and fully to the lordship and the dominion of Jesus Christ, his word, and the Holy Spirit. And so if the word tells me something, I'm going to go the direction the word says. Amen? Somebody asked me a couple of years ago, why aren't you going to do this? Why aren't going to have this person? I said, because the Holy Spirit said no, and the Holy Spirit knows what he means. The Holy Spirit says do something, and you do what the Holy Spirit says. Hallelujah. Now, we found out the truth about what was going on, and it's very good that we obey God. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But we submit ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Now, Esther submitted first to Mordecai. She did what her uncle told her. But then as we read on in Esther chapter 2, verse 15, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing except what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in his sight of all those that looked upon her. Not only did she submit herself, number one, to Mordecai. See, you got to start at the low level before you go to the high level. But then she submitted. She could have had anything she wanted. But she said, it's not important what I want. What does the king want? And she only took exactly what Haggai said for her to take. She only wore what he said to wear, so on and so forth. And Esther obtained favor, notice this in verse 15, in the sight of all those who looked upon her. So she had favor with her uncle. She had favor with the keeper of the women. And then she had favor with all the people. So Esther was taken to the king in verse 16. Ahasuerus, into his house royal in the 10th month, which is the month of Timoth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all of the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen in the place of Ashidi. So the first point that we find about faith in the life of Esther is humility. And if you really want to be a great person of faith, and if you really want to operate in great authority, you must first humble yourself before God. And you must learn to listen to godly authority. The key word in humility is listen. If you listen. See, I believe we get so busy in our daily life. We get so busy doing what we want to do, going where we want to go. We think we have all these that we don't take time to listen to the Holy Spirit. We don't take time to listen, even sometimes to other people. Did you know what? I listen. I am always listening. And many times I hear God, not only in the voice of the word, not only in the voice of the Holy Spirit, but many times I hear God speaking through other people because I'm listening to hear the voice of God. That doesn't mean that I do everything that people want me to do. No, I don't nearly do everything that everyone wants me to do. Because ultimately, but what I seek to do is I seek to hear the voice of God. And I want to humble myself before God because God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Humility is a key of faith. In chapter 3, Haman was the governor of this kingdom. He worked right under Ahasuerus the king. And Mordecai, Esther's uncle, happened to be working right in the king's gate. And so when Haman would come through, everyone would bow to Haman with the exception of Mordecai. Mordecai did not bow to this wicked 
ruler. Respect this wicked ruler. And it says this in Esther chapter 3, verse 4, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow nor give him reverence, then Haman was full of wrath. He was proud. He was angry. He was prejudiced. He hated the Jews. Haman was a very wealthy man, so Haman went to king. He said, king, there's this bunch of people. They don't go by your laws. They kind of do their own thing. They're kind of spread throughout all the kingdom. But I'll tell you what I'll do, king. I will pay personally $300 million. And we will make a law and we will annihilate the Jews. We'll exterminate them. We're going to wipe them off the planet. It's not new, guys. It's old news. It's come around again. It's the same spirit. The same spirit that was in Haman. The same spirit that was in Hitler. The same spirit that's in Hamas. It's the same spirit. They don't have a right to be here. We're going to wipe them off the planet. By the way, many of these people that hate the Jews hate the United States of America. Aaron recently saw a video with people, terrorists, that have infiltrated the United States of America chanting death to America. So he told the king, let's let's write this law. And the king thought it was a good idea. He took his ring from his hand, gave it to Haman the son in verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10. To Haman, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said to Haman, the silver is given to you, the people also to do with them as seems good to you. Letters were sent in verse 13 by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all the Jews, both young and old. Little children and women in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, to take spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment was given in every province published to all the people that they would be ready against that day. The posts went out. They were hastened by the king's commandment. The decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the people of Shushan were perplexed. I believe the people in America, especially those who don't know God, especially those who don't know the truth, or perplexed, they really don't even understand what this is about. Now when this came, Mordecai went to Esther. It says this in verse 11, all the king's servants and the people, this is chapter 4, verse 11, of the king's provinces that know whoever, whether man or woman, shall come to the king in the inner court. Mordecai said, Esther, you've got to say something to the king. You've got to stop this. This crazy thing that's going down. Who is not called, there, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have, Esther says, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai Esther's words. You know, the second thing that I see in Esther was Esther was a person of courage. And even though it, was a threat to her life to go in before the king. She said, you know what? I am going to do it. And so, again, Mordecai gave her this word and basically said, if you don't stand up, if you don't say something, in verse 13 of chapter 4, do not think that you will escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. If we as the church... Quit being salt. 
If we quit being light, if we quit saying something about all the crazy stuff that's going down in the world, don't think that you're going to be spared more than anybody else. We are called to be the salt of the earth. We are called to be the light of the world. We're called to stand up. We're called to tell the truth. We're called to not be ashamed. We're called not to be afraid. Sometimes it's hard not to be afraid. And he said in verse 14, if you all together hold your peace at this time, then there will be an enlargement and deliverance to the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will be destroyed. And who knows that you are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. The third thing that I see in Esther was she lived for a purpose greater than herself. And I believe that we as the people of God are called to live for a purpose that is greater than ourselves. I believe that we are called to live for the purposes of God, to stand for the purposes of God, to speak for the purposes of God, no matter who loves us or who hates us. I believe that we are called to stand up and to speak up and to say something. And I believe just like in Esther's day, the people of God, because she stood up, because she said something, because she did something, the people of God were preserved. I believe just like in the Egyptian kingdom, right, when Moses stood up, the people of God were preserved. Just like in the Assyrian kingdom, the people of God were preserved. Just like in the Babylonian kingdom, when Daniel stood up, the people of God were preserved. Just like in this kingdom, the media Persian empire, the largest Gentile empire in the world, Esther stood up, the people of God were preserved. Just like in the Grecian empire, the people of God were preserved. Just like in the Roman empire, because there were people that were boldly speaking the truth, just like Jesus, just like the Apostle Paul, the people of God were preserved. I believe in the day that we live in, if we'll stand up as the church, if we'll let our light shine, if we'll speak out, the people of God will be preserved. We're called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now we go on. So what happens? Esther tells everybody to pray, and then she goes into the king. Chapter 5, verse 1, it came to pass on the third day, Esther put on her royal apparel. She stood in the inner court of the king's house against the king's house. The king sat on his royal th throne in the royal house against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. You see, if she wasn't invited to come, it was off with your head. Didn't matter who you were. You didn't go into the king's presence without being ready. So Esther drew near and touched the top of his scepter. Then the king said unto her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? It will be given to you up to half of the kingdom. Esther said, my petition in verse 7 and request is of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition, to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to a banquet that I will prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. So she prepared him one banquet, right? He came in and said, what do you want? She said, come again. Now, you know what? Esther was a smart woman. She knew the way to every man's heart is through his mouth. Lester Sumrall said, we're belly people. I used to have this one friend. He was so conservative. He was very wealthy. But he would drive from Colorado down to the south part of Mexico without buying a hotel room. But he said one thing. 
we eat really well. <laughs> he was so conservative. He would drive all day, drive all night, sleep in the car. But boy, when it came dinner time, they ate well. Hallelujah. You know, that's how men are. We get up in the morning and say, what's for breakfast? We leave for work and say, what's for lunch? What's going to be for dinner? I mean, we're always thinking about what. And so she knew how to get to his heart. Now, you know, uh, she was there. So uh, he said, I'll do that. She obtained favor. This is the third thing. She was, or the fourth thing. She was acceptant in his presence. You see, acceptance is a key to faith. We're accepted in the beloved. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. We're accepted today because of the blood of Jesus, because of the grace of God. We are accepted in the presence of God. And when we come to, the, to God, we come in the name of Jesus, and we come by the grace of God. And we stand in grace, right, looking for the glory of God, looking for the answer. When Haman went out that day, Mordecai, again, refused to bow. He could not stand that prejudiced fool. And, and so he went home. And he was very excited. He'd been to this banquet with Esther. And, and, and he was invited to come the, the next day. But he went home in verse 13 of chapter 5. He tells his wife, all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Here is this person who does not respect me. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends to him, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high, 75 feet high, and tomorrow speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go out merrily with the king to the banquet, and the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, that night the king couldn't sleep. He found out there had been a conspiracy in the kingdom. Esther had told him, and Mordecai had told Esther. And there were two people of his close advisors that were going to take his life. They've checked the matter out, and they put the people to death. You can read about it in the end of chapter 2. He said, what has been done to honor Mordecai? They said, nothing. So Haman comes in the next day to the banquet, and, he, and, and the king says, Haman? He says, governor, what shall we do to honor the man that I, the king, want to honor? Haman lifted up in his pride, thinks, there is no one the king would rather honor than me. Bring the king's robe in his royal outfit. Bring the king's crown. It's the gold, right? And the glory. Bring the king's horse and then have someone, you know, put him on the king's horse and parade him in the king's robe with the king's crown. And, and the person go before him and, 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 and tell all the people, this is the man that the king wants to honor. Bow before him. King said, great idea, go get Mordecai, put, it, put my clothes on him, put my crown on him, put him on my horse, and you lead him through the streets. Oh, wow. What a turn of events. Mordecai came again the next day to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning, having his head covered. Haman told Zeresh, his wife, in verse 13, this is chapter 6, verse 13, and his friends, everything that had befallen him, then said his wife, how, how amazing how people change, if Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before you've begun to fall, then you will not prevail against him, but you will surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking to him, the king's chamberlains hasted to bring Haman to the banquet that Esther prepared. Chapter 7, verse 1, so the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said against, again to Esther, Esther, whatever you want, I'll give you anything. She had so much grace, so much favor, up to half of my kingdom. Verse 3, then Esther, the king, answered and said, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, 
And if I please the king, let my life be given to me at, your, at my petition and my people, at my request, for we are sold to be destroyed and slain, to perish, to be annihilated. But if we had been sold for slaves, I would have held my tongue. Then King Ahasuerus answered, said to Esther the queen, who is he who has presumed in his heart to do this? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. The king was so angry, he got up from the banquet and went to his palace garden. Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. The king returned out of the palace in verse 8. In, into the banquet of wine, and Haman was falling on the bed where Esther was. The king said, will he force the queen? I'm telling you, he was a little bit emotional at that point. Before me in my house, and the word went out of his mouth, and they covered Haman's face. Harbona, one of the king's chamberlains, said, Behold also the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman has made for Mordecai, stands in his house. And the king said, hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. You know, my mama had this saying in her kitchen right over her kitchen sink in our trailer house when I was a kid. It said, be careful of the words you speak. Keep them soft and sweet. You never know from day to day which ones you'll have to eat. Be careful what you sow. Because what you sow, you might reap. Chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, to Esther the queen. Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. The king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. Mordecai became the governor, and Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spoke again in chapter, th in chapter 8, verse 3, before the king, fell down at his feet, and asked him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, and the device that he devised against the Jews. The king held out his golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, if it please the king, if I found favor in his sight and this thing is right before the king, if it's pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are in the king's provinces. Verse 7 says, Then the king Ahasuerus said to Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, I have given Esther the house of Haman, him have they hanged on the gallows, because he laid his hands upon the Jews. Why was he destroyed? Because he stood against the people of God. Verse 11 says, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, to, to stand for their lives, to destroy, to slay, to cause, to perish, all the power of the people and the provinces that would assault them, both little ones, women, to take the spoil of them for prey. So the next thing we see is the power of the covenant. And in the power of the covenant, the curse has been reversed. Did you know, my brothers and sisters, that we as Gentile believers have entered into a covenant that God made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob who became Israel. We have entered into this same covenant by faith in Jesus Christ. 
Galatians chapter 3 tells us that. And it tells us that all who live by faith are blessed with believing Abraham. It goes on to tell us in in verse 13 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We as Gentiles who believed on Jesus have entered into a Jewish covenant, have entered into a covenant that God made with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob and all of those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham by faith in Jesus and we have entered this same covenant. And all who put their faith in Jesus are brothers and sisters with the people of Israel, the people of God. God has stood for the nation of Israel in time past, and I submit to you today that God will stand for the nation of Israel in the time in which we live. And if we in America are smart, we in America will stand with God, and we will stand with the nation of Israel against the vile attacks of the enemy, against those who would try to annihilate them against those who even the the liberal fetterman on the east coast says that Israel was attacked by the Hamas and Israel needs to stand against this attack of the enemy. If a man who is that liberal can figure it out, I think those of us in the church ought to be wise enough to figure it out The curse has been reversed, thank God, in Jesus Christ. And we today are receiving the benefits of the same covenant that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Israel received by faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, they get the benefits of the covenant the same way that we do by faith in Jesus Christ. So the king granted them. In verse 11 of Esther chapter 8, of the Jews which were in every city to gather themselves together to stand for their lives, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish all the power of the people, and the province would assault them, both little ones and women, to take spoil of them as prey. Verse 15 says, And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold, with a garment of fine linen and purple, And the city of Shushan rejoiced. See, before they were perplexed. You see, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. The people rejoiced and were glad. And the Jews had light and gladness and honor. And in every province, in every city where the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews. Ha ha, they were accepted. Did you know that God accepts non-Jews in the covenant? Hallelujah. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. I hope the fear of God will fall on some of you. I hope the fear of God, I hope you'll start believing the Bible instead of believing all these crazy liberals. Believing this wokeism and this crazy stuff that's going forward. One day I was preaching here and I thought that is so bold. Before I preached, I asked God if he would speak through me. I thought this is so bold. And then that afternoon I went home. And usually if we watch any news, I watch very little. Barbara watches, we don't have any cable subscription. So we only watch free things on the internet. So she watches very conservative news on the internet as a whole. But that afternoon I flipped on Something that came out of MSNBC. And I saw our current vice president and what she was saying. And our current administration has been on the wrong side of everything. 
And I thought, what I said today was so bold. And it is so contrary with what the world is saying. But why should we be here in the church trying to appease the world? We need to be fearing God more than we fear this world. We need to be standing for truth more than we stand up for the things of this world and how the world thinks about things. I tell you, you need to go back and check your Bible. You need to read it through again. You need to see what it actually says and start living by the Word of God and not just talking about it. It says in the 12th month, 8 or the 13th day of the month, the king's commandment came. His decree, chapter 9, verse 1, drew near to be put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them. Though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had rule over them who hated them. Verse 10 of chapter 9 says, The ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they slew, but on the spoil they laid not their hand. Then Esther said in verse 13, If it pleased the king to be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow according to this day's decree, let Haman's ten sons be hanged on a gallows. Now they were already dead. Why did she want to have them hanged? Because she said, we want to make an example out of all of those who stand against God and who stand against the people of God. And if you're going to stand against Israel, if you're going to stand against God, if you're going to stand against the people of God, this is going to become a day you'll be made an example of. I know this is old school, but listen, that's exactly what they did. But not only did they stop those It goes on in verse 16 and says, the other Jews who were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes 75,000. You see, the spirit, the spirit that was working in Pharaoh when he forgot about Joseph and wanted to kill all the Hebrew boys. The spirit that was working, right? In these other kingdoms and these other leaders, that spirit is still around today. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit that was working in Hitler was the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit that is working in Hamas is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit is, that is working in these terrorists that have infiltrated America and are chanting from the river to the sea and are chanting death to America is the same spirit. It is the spirit of the Antichrist. And we, the people of Christ, need to stand against the spirit of Antichrist. The curse was reversed. Thank God Jesus reversed the curse. And if we believe the word, we can see the curse reversed in our own life. Verse 18 says, But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day, the 14th thereof, this is chapter 9, and on the 15th day of the same they rested, they had a day of feasting and gladness. Verse 22 says, And the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, the month which was turned from them to sorrow to joy, from morning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, sending portions to one another and gifts for the poor. You know what? They had great joy. Verse 28 says, chapter 9, These days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, Every city, all these days of Purim should be, he should should not fail from among the Jews, nor a memorial of them perish from their seed. Did you know we as the people of God need to celebrate? We need to rejoice. We need to remember the good things that God has done for us. All of God's people should do the same. And you know what joy is? Joy is a fruit of faith. And when you have faith, you can look out in the world 
And you can see all the crazy things that are going down and you can rejoice because you are a person of faith. And you know that God has a plan. He goes on, then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abihail, Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. He sent letters unto all the Jews, the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, with words of peace and truth. Not only did they have joy, but do you know what? They had peace. And peace, my friends, is the result of having faith in Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 10, we'll read all three verses. The king Ahasuerus laid a tribute on the land and upon the isles of the sea, all the acts of his power and his might and declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, Whereunto the king advanced him, aren't they written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren. He sought the wealth of his people and spoke peace to all of his seed. I believe that we should be like Mordecai. We should seek the wealth of the people of God and speak peace to the people of God. Now, what about Esther? How did this end up? Different Bible scholars have different opinions. But I read in the notes of Finnis Dake, and, and I really liked what I read. This happened about 500 B.C. Who was the king? That's where different Bible scholars disagree. And Finnis Dake submits, and I believe it is probably the truth, that more than likely, the king was Darius. And Darius married Esther, and she was the mother of Cyrus. Do you know who Cyrus was? Cyrus was a Gentile king who commanded the rebuilding of the temple of God, who had favor on the people of Israel and the people of God. More than likely, that's what happened. Maybe we'll find out when we get to heaven. How does this fit in with our modern day? Did you know Trump has been called by some as a modern day Cyrus. Trump as a whole, when he was president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, stood for Israel. He stood for the church. And he stood for life. I am here to tell you, I don't care what any political leader says. Whether they say they're born again or they say they're not born again. Where I stand with political leaders is what do they do? Where do they stand on policy? We have some local leaders who claim to be born again. But on policy, now they're doing some good things. But on policy as a whole, they are on the wrong side. I was talking to Andrew Womack about this. Andrew was just here. We recorded six broadcasts that he recorded with me for our television broadcast on grace and faith. I appreciate his generosity. I waited six months for that to happen. I was very thrilled. You know what Andrew told me when I talked to him about that? He said, the last time that I voted for somebody who said that they were born again, and I voted for them because they said that they were born again, I voted for Jimmy Carter. He said, that is the last time that I'm going to ever vote for somebody because they say that they're born again. He said, I'll tell you why I vote for people. I vote for people 
because they stand on the right side of policy. So I'm going to vote for leaders, not because they're popular, not because the world loves them, but I'm going to vote for leaders that stand up for Israel. I'm going to vote for leaders that stand up for life. Donald Trump did more to stop abortion and stand up for life than any president in my life. And Donald Trump stood up for the church of Jesus Christ. And I think it's time for the church of America to stand up. I think it's time for the church of America to be salt, to be light, and not to care what the world thinks, not to care what the world says, and not to let this liberal, woke bunch of nuts try to tell us that what we're to believe. We need to keep standing up for truth, we need to keep standing up for life, and we, for God's sake, need to stand up for Israel. My last words, my conclusion, faith may not be popular, but it's powerful when we live in the purpose of God. God bless you. I love you. Awesome. It's great to see everyone today. Right now we're going to receive tithes and offerings. If you'd like to give, there are um, offering stations uh, by the door. You can um, drop off your offerings there after service. There's um, envelopes in the backs of the chairs. Um, just as you drop them off, be sure to put them in the slots. You can also text to give or give online. The scripture that uh, has been on my heart for offering today, it's from Psalm 112. Of the first few verses here, it says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. I love this. It says when we delight in his commandments. That means when, when, we, when we follow what the word says, when, we, when we're led by the spirit and do what God says and not just do it, but delight in it. You know, as God um, instructs us and leads us to give, you know, the Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. When you delight in it, there is supernatural blessing, such great blessing that it doesn't just affect you, but it affects your descendants. It affects people after you. I know part of the blessing that's on my life, it's because my parents um, followed God and not only just followed him, but delighted to follow him, delighted to step out in faith, delighted to give, delighted to, 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 to do what his word says. And it, it affects not just you, but um, generations after you. It says the generation of the upright will be blessed. And then it says wealth and riches will be in his house. Say wealth and riches. Man, I love that. Wealth and riches will be in his house, house and his righteousness endures forever. You know, um, th there's a lot of people in the world that are wealthy, but very poor people. They might have a lot, of, a lot of things. They might be successful in their career. They might have the house, the car, the job, but they're still very poor uh, on the inside. You know, the blessing of the Lord is different than the blessing that can come from this world. The blessing of the Lord makes someone rich, truly rich. That means he gives you joy, he gives you peace, he gives you purpose, he gives you a sense of fulfillment, and that comes from a relationship with God. The, the blessing of the Lord makes someone rich. The blessing that comes from the world can't really make you rich. That's why there's a lot of wealthy people who are still very miserable. But the blessing of the Lord is different. It makes you rich in so many areas. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. I love that, amen. And, and the blessing of the Lord, it's a real thing. It's, it's supernatural, amen. I believe that God wants to bless you so much that he makes you an advertisement of his goodness, amen. So as you give today, give as the Lord instructs you, give as the Lord leads you. And I believe it's not just gonna bless you, but it's gonna bless people around you as well, amen. Let's all stand up. I wanna close in prayer right now. Our prayer ministers can come forward. First of all, if there's someone here today who hasn't given your life to Jesus, I want to give you this opportunity to, to commit your life to Jesus. I know that if you give your life to Jesus, you'll never be the same. That'll be the greatest decision of your life. So if, if you want to do that here in a moment, you can come forward and receive prayer. Also, if there's anyone here today who hasn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, that's available for any believer. I love that the church was born in the upper room in Jerusalem. I love, I love, uh, my dad mentioned Donald Trump. One thing I'm very happy about um, that Trump did during his presidency is that he moved the, the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So there's 97 nations that have embassies in Israel, only five of them 
um, actually have honored Israel by, by putting their, their embassy in the capital of Israel, which is Jerusalem. So there's only five nations, and the U.S. is the only superpower that has their embassy in Jerusalem. The three previous U.S. presidents promised to do that, but never did. Like my dad said, he, he likes what Donald Trump did. And, um, you know, he really honored Israel. And there's something very profound about the U.S. Embassy being in, in Jerusalem. You know, we have le legally there is American soil in Jerusalem. You know, politically there is American soil in Jerusalem. And I believe that also, that, 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 um, that gives us a spiritual tie to Israel as well. It gives us, there, there's something very important prophetically about there being American soil in Jerusalem. We're tied at a deep level. That's the, you know, the, the antichrist spirit that hates Israel. It also hates the freedom of America. And America is a Christian nation. That's why that antichrist spirit that hates Israel, it hates America as well. And even, even people who've come into the, the United States, you know, I, I saw a video my dad mentioned of people in Dearborn, Michigan shouting, death to America. And it's, the, it's that antichrist spirit, you know, and, and Iran has launched hundreds of drones and missiles indiscriminately into Israel. People, you know, ha, have been accusing Israel of committing genocide, but no one's saying this is true genocide here. They're just, you know, aiming for, for Tel Aviv for the largest population of Israel. And Heather, I, I was talking about this to her last night, and she said the antichrist spirit is a narcissist spirit. That means it accuses people of something that they're not really doing, but then they're fine with it happening. Amen. It's a not man, man that, that that narcissist that, that that's from the devil. But I was praying for Iran. You know, um, as a church, we support over sixty different ministries every year. But there's a ministry we supported for a number of years called World Compassion, and they. Um, they um, spread the gospel to, to the most hostile, um, to Christian nations in the world. And we've actually helped World Compassion smuggle Bibles into Iran. There's revival going on in Iran. And I believe this, this, this um, junk that's been happening, I, I believe that God's going to turn it around. I believe those, fl those flames of revival are going to be fanned right now. And that, that people in Iran who are, who are against that... Um, what's going on. There's going to be revival. There's going to be more people stepping up. I believe there are women that are going to step up into Christian leadership in Iran, in these underground homes. I believe that women are going to step into the role of pastors over these home churches. They already have, but I believe more and more women are going to, are going to remove the shackles of Islam and lead people to Christ, lead people in the gospel, lead their homes. Amen. And we're a part of that. I just want to sh say really quickly, we supported this missionary for years, and, and uh, he went home, Terry Law, Dr. Terry Law, he, he went home to be with the Lord, but his son Jason Law is carrying on his ministry, and recently they contacted us, and so just recently we have sent more Bibles uh, to be uh, delivered into these Islamic nations, specifically Iran. Many of you may not know this, but there is a huge revival that is happening right now in Iran. They're closing many mosques, and many people are coming to Christ. So these people are crying out for Bibles. So there's people that are coming to Christ, and it's our desire for people to come to Christ wherever they, they are. Aaron actually stood on this platform in a prophetic meeting a number of years ago, and he said there is going to be a great revival in the Middle East, and we are seeing that happen we're hearing the response of that but we need to pray for israel we need to pray we've got family members uh dr henderson's brother-in-law is there they have three children they're in israel they sent a text they're in bomb shelters right now protecting their lives we need to pray for israel we need to pray i was talking to derek wilburn early in the service but his son is a serviceman he was called and he's right now in europe he was just uh, put on active duty in Europe because of the things that are happening in the Middle East. He flies for the Air Force. But we need to pray for our government. We need to pray for our military. We need to pray for the nation of Israel. Praise God. And we need to keep moving forward in the things of God. There's never been a time like now to live for Jesus.
Amen. So I'm going to close in prayer here. Um, again, if, if you want to receive Jesus, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, re- um, receive prayer for anything at all, um, we have great people of faith who will believe with you, who, who will encourage you. And I know that God hears our prayers and he answers prayer. Amen. So I'm going to pray for everyone. If you need individual, individual prayers, just come forward after, after um, I'm done here. So God, thank you so much for this church. I just thank you, Lord, that we have eyes to see what's really happening. We have ears to hear and we have hearts to understand, Lord. So I just think that your spirit is here in this place. And I just thank you that you answer our prayers. We just thank you, God. You are a God who hears our prayers and you answer our prayers. So right now, we just pray for for, um, supernatural protection for innocent lives. We just pray for the nation of Israel. We just um, come against the spirit of Antichrist, Lord, and we're going to shine our light bright before men that they may see um, the truth. We're going to shine. We just think that we have a spirit of truth that leads us. We will not be deceived, but we have the spirit of truth that leads us and guides us. So I just thank you, Lord, for, for that spirit of truth inside of us right now. I just thank you for this church. I just think that we are a city that is set on a hill, Lord. I just think that we can shine this light before this area, before this town, before this city, before this nation, Lord. And I just think that the gospel is going to go out and there's just going to be an acceleration of the gospel touching people's hearts all around the world. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for being here today. If you need prayer, just come forward. You're all dismissed. See you again soon.